Good afternoon. I'd like to bring things to, to order uh, and to begin our, today's events. Uh, please join me in welcoming the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. And thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Library of Congress this afternoon as we commemorate a significant moment in American history. The staff of the 1974 inquiry into the impeachment of President Richard Nixon were faced with an enormous task. At a time when American faith in the presidency was shaken, as staff, you had to work to help the 93rd Congress decide whether President Nixon's actions required him to face the second presidential impeachment in American history and the first in 100 years. While President Nixon resigned before impeachment went forward, the adoption by the House Judiciary Committee of three articles of impeachment during the summer of 1974 was hugely important in setting the events of the following months in motion. Now, many historians mark this era as the beginning of a decline of trust in American institutions. But it is also a story of functioning checks and balances. In your roles as congressional staffers, lawyers, and researchers, you worked as staff to find the truth of whether President Nixon had obstructed justice and abused power, and if so, how he should be held to account. And that work helped shape American history. So we are very pleased to see all of you gathered here today to reflect on this momentous occasion 50 years later. We're eager to hear how you look back on that time now after distinguished careers in law, academia, and politics. And I'd like to thank the John W. Kluge Center for hosting the event. The Kluge Center is the library's in-house center for scholarship and research. And each year, they bring around 100 scholars to use the library's collections to produce exciting new work. So today, we'll have two panel discussions. The first will focus on the legacy of the inquiry, and the second will consider what it is like and what it was like to be there. So now, to get us started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Timothy Neftali, who will moderate the first panel. Dr. Neftali is a presidential historian at the Institute of Global Politics at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. He was also the first director of the Federal Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. Please join me in welcoming him. First of all, I would like to thank the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Hayden. I'd like to thank Dr. Butterfield of the Kluge Center, and I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this great event. Uh, the two representatives I spoke with, Evan Davis, who's on the panel, and Mike Conway. Thank you. I've asked the panelists to start with a few minutes of reflection on the legacy of the uh, impeachment inquiry and any takeaways that they'd like to share. And then after we go through each of the panelists, we'll have a group discussion. So Francis O'Brien, start us off, please. Hi, my name is Francis O'Brien. Uh, I'm meeting 90% of you the first time because uh, I worked for the chairman on his personal staff and I wasn't allowed to meet any of you um, <laughs> by John Doerr's rule. Uh, because we would pollute you. Um, so, so now I'm going to try to re-pollute you. Um, so I want to set the scene a little bit. So 1972 uh, was, it, was the election. President Nixon uh, won again. There was a little known election that took place that year. A young woman out of Brooklyn uh, named Liz Holtzman ran against a congressman for 50 years named Manny Seller. And Manny Seller was a true hero of the civil rights era, bringing all this uh, civil rights legislation to fore. But Manny Seller uh, uh, 
lost to this young woman out of Brooklyn. And I think, and I could be corrected, I think her campaign was run by Bernie Nussbaum. Um, and I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what- He was her lawyer in the contest. Was he? Okay. All right. So uh, that's, that sets up Peter Rodino, next in line, becomes uh, the chairman of the committee. Now, outside of Congress, nobody knew uh, Peter Rodino. Inside, he had been a member for 25 years, respected uh, on both sides of the aisle, um, well-liked, uh, a liberal politician out of uh, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and to, to set the scene, so the Watergate Committee started its investigation after the election. On the House side, and Tim can correct me here, no one even thought of impeachment. So all of while the Watergate hearing was going on, I believe during that whole period in 73, maybe one, maybe two articles were introduced. Maybe John Conyers and maybe Bob Drynan, maybe, right? It just was not even contemplated that something that was in, in the Constitution would ever be used. Certainly the chairman, no idea. It never came up in, while the Watergate hearings were going on, and our, you know, I was in his personal staff, it was never talked about. The Saturday night firings took place, and everything, absolutely everything in the world changed. Um, and everybody here can say, oh, I remember where I was, et cetera, and all of that. Anyway, I, I, was, I hadn't been in New York that weekend, I came back, and everything did change. Um, and impeachment became on, on the front burner. And the speaker, Carl Albert, and Majority Leader Tip O'Neill, and the other leadership decided that, the, that they would go forward with an inquiry, uh, was voted on by the House, and that it would reside in the Judiciary Committee, and that Peter Rodino would, as chairman, run the committee. Uh, now, inside Congress, inside a House, that was a good choice. Uh, they, they had a lot, the, the speaker and the um, and majority and the other leaders had great respect for him. He met some opposition from sort of the most activist members uh, of the party and from outsiders who didn't know him. But the decision was made, there was no doubt that he would take over. That period, Peter Rodino, in my view and my relationship with him, had no thought that this president would ever be impeached. He just thought that it just was not possible. And you think, you know, and that's where we began. A decision was made soon after that we would hire a separate staff to, um, to do the investigation, and that's, that's all of you. Uh, the chairman then decided that uh, John Doerr would be the leader of that, um, of that undertaking, and then I think the rest of the group here will go in detail I just have one minor story before I turn it back to you folks, um, a John Doerr story. Uh, so after John was chosen and trying to, under extraordinary pressure, put this team together, uh, John was very sensitive that he wanted to make sure that only the best were hired, uh, the most competent people, the most uh, not activists, he used that word a lot. He didn't want any activists, just like the chairman. It was very important that you don't hire somebody who, uh, who was just dead on uh, in getting uh, Richard Nixon uh, out of office. John, like we all do, he went to people he knew to try to find uh, you know, the various staff members John had a hard time dealing with that. This was actually a congressional undertaking and that Congress people would have a, 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 a voice in uh, who they'd hire. So, and the chairman, for those you know, he never said, and Rana knows, 
he never said anything directly, but, um, but I knew what he wanted. So there's this pile of resumes, you amongst them, was sitting on, sitting on my desk. And um, that's all, he just would put these resumes on my desk. And they were resumes from highly qualified um, individuals that the speaker, the majority leader, and other members of Congress wanted to at least have them interviewed. And we were having some challenges on, on this front. So one Friday night, John came over, we did you know usual housekeeping stuff. And I thought, I, I have to deal with this. So I'm thinking in my mind, how, how am I gonna approach John on this subject? So I said, hmm. So let me, so I said, John, I, the chairman, think about bubbles ahead of my head uh, over here. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm trying to think ahead what John, how John's gonna react. So I said, the chairman is just extraordinarily pleased with the folks you've, you've hired so far, the speed, the quality. He just, you know, he couldn't be more impressed. So that's, that's the intro. Now, I had to get to this. I said, now the chairman um, wants to make sure you hire a diverse staff. So I thought in my mind, I know what he's going to say. He didn't say that. He looked at me and he said, what do you mean by the word diverse? <laughs> so I thought for a minute. I said, how about we start not from Yale? He almost, he almost, he almost smiled and thought better of it. Uh, by the way, I, I love all you people from Yale. Um, but anyway, I'll turn it back to you, Tim, and go from there. Uh, thank bula bula. Uh, Richard Gill. I'm not sure exactly how, how uh, I, I got chosen. I, if you look at the... Uh, congressional quarterly that published it. Uh, it had a page that said the chiefs and the Indians. And of all of the chiefs, such as it was, the only three of us still alive, and that's Evan and me and, and Judge Bob Sack. So I guess we were the we are the quote senior chiefs, but we were never chiefs in the organization. We never thought of that, it wasn't structured that way. Everybody worked on whatever they needed to work on and, and they were, uh, it, the, that title was kind of a standing joke among us. But I did uh, bring something before, I, because uh, Bob uh, Shelton said something, said think about stories we're talking to each other. We were all there. So we've all experienced the same things and, uh, and so it's not a revelation to a, an audience of strangers, but I thought, y'all, people would like to remember something historic. How many of you remember these? Uh, they, uh, uh, they, this one's getting a little yellowed and tattered, but uh, this is a, the kind of this is the work product, and, and we all remember so well passing out to the congressman all those volumes of these. I think there were 38 of them in all. Uh, and so this, I don't know how many of these survive, but uh, I, I think this, this group would understand and appreciate it. I do know quickly that we were asked to talk about legacy, and I, I don't know that I know exactly how to quantify this. We knew, we knew and I say we, John Dord knew and the chairman knew and then eventually passed to all of us, that this was not going to be conducted like a typical congressional hearing where people are lined, uh, it, the witnesses come before the committees, they're questioned by congressmen, most of whom don't know very many facts, but they've got some bullet point sheets in front of them, and, and it's hostile. This one's trying to score points on this side, and this one's trying to score points on that side, and it kind of ends up leading to nothing. And we were told this is not going to be like that. We are not prosecutors. We are lawyers representing a client, the client being the Judiciary Committee as a whole, not the Republicans, not the Democrats. And we're going to find out what the facts are. And it was an inquiry into whether or not 
the facts led congressmen, because we didn't get to vote on it, would lead congressmen to vote to impeach the president. And John Doyle was very serious about that. And as Francis said, if you came to the job with an idea, I want to get the president, you would not be hired. It was just that clear. That, that was a disqualifying attitude because you were there to find out what facts were we forget. We don't, this group doesn't forget. There were hundreds of thousands of undigested pages that the Senate Select Committee had, a, had a gathered. There were depositions, there were documents, thousands of them, and there were 56 different things that the president was accused of that had to be investigated and determine what the actual facts about it were. And so that was our task to start with. And so that legacy of finding out what the truth is was the first thing I would say. And, and John Doyle was absolutely meticulous. You didn't write something down and put it in one of these notebooks as if it were a fact, unless you had backup documents, backup sworn testimony, right behind every statement that's in there. Remember, they became known as statements of information because you didn't even want to argue that they were facts. They were information. But the information had to be verified and it wouldn't get in there. And we weren't to speculate. We weren't to make surmises. We weren't to make assumptions. And so that kind of method or manner of approaching it is one of the legacies that I, I think this group can be proud of. And the other was, nobody knew what an impeachable offense was. There's no standard in the Constitution that is precise. It uses some words, but they largely derive from English parliamentary history. And the, the, uh, the Andrew Johnson impeachment was always a farce. It was a, a statute created to bait the president into violating it and then say he could be impeached because he violated the Tenure of Office Act. So it was no help. And so there was a whole staff charged with trying to define it. And the answer ended up, and this is the other legacy, it has to be something serious affecting the function of the constitutional order of the government. Impeachment is a part of the checks and balances built into the Constitution. And it's not for political yah yah or revenge one party against the other, like the uh, Venetian Republic or uh, Florentine Republic, where uh, a, a, a dominant party in Congress uses it as a weapon to get at their political enemies. It's got to be something more serious. It's not for just a common law crime. It's for something affecting the function of state. And it should not be entered into lightly or as, as a matter of political tactics. Uh, that's the only other part of the legacy I would comment on. So, thank you, Mr. Gill. <laughs> Secretary Clinton. Well, I want to pick up where uh, Richard um, ended because I I think those are two really important uh, pieces of the legacy. Uh, you know, looking back at it, uh, this was such an extraordinary undertaking. Uh, and the uh, charge that Chairman Rodino gave to John Doerr and the way that uh, the House established the impeachment inquiry uh, so that it was something that um, was legitimately meant to conduct an inquiry, figure out whether there is any basis for uh, recommendations uh, by the Judiciary Committee with respect to articles of impeachment. And the way that uh, you know, John Doerr structured us, the way he terrified us about keeping everything to ourselves and never talking to anybody about anything, uh, the way the statements of information uh, was established as the basis of uh, trying to compile, catalog, and eventually uh, try to you know, understand patterns within uh, those statements of information with respect to uh, what they uh, would reveal to uh, the uh, staff. All of that was very deliberately designed uh, in order to run as 
uh, careful a process without any pre-existing judgment as possible. I think it succeeded. I think in you know every way that I know of, looking back at it, um, probably we were aided by the absence of cell phones, uh, so that you know reporters yelled at us as we left uh, our offices very occasionally to get something to eat uh, or get a little air. Uh, but there was a, a, a real sense of obligation uh, among the staff about what we were expected uh, not only to do, but how we were supposed to conduct ourselves. Um, and the challenge of trying to define, number one, what is an impeachable offense, what is a high crime or misdemeanor, um, led to a lot of really interesting discussions back and forth uh, as people were attempting to uh, you know, present that and come up with some substantive basis on which uh, the committee and eventually the Congress and the country could understand it. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, reflecting back on common law, looking, uh, someone once suggested, and it turned out to be a, a very uh, intriguing uh, uh, way to approach it, that the Declaration of Independence laid out all these grievances against King George and those grievances were long lists about how he had abused his power with respect to treating the people uh, in the colonies. And that became a, a kind of interesting way to take the, you know, the English common law, look at what early Americans had done in their efforts to try to justify uh, you know, their actions because of what they viewed as abuses of power uh, from the monarch. Uh, so we had to come up with a memo that did describe that, and then we had to figure out, well, how, how do we proceed? What is the process? I mean, who does what? How do you make a presentation? What, what is the inquiry staff supposed to be doing with respect to a presentation of these statements of information uh, to the committee? And that went through several iterations, because I think John's, John Doerr's original idea was we were going to present a bunch of briefing books to the committee, and the committee was, well, you gotta tell us what you think about that. You can't just give us hundreds, thousands of pages of you know, statements of information. You have to help us figure out what we're supposed to make of it, and what is the procedure we are supposed to be using. And I remember, you know, going over to the Congress with, with John and Joe Woods, and because I'd been working on the procedures, um, they invited me to uh, go along. And, you know, having John and Joe explain to the committee how we were going to be working uh, in order to make a presentation uh, to them once we had uh, gathered up uh, sufficient uh, uh, facts. A lot of that was both uh, accelerated and, and deepened uh, when we got the tapes. And that added an enormous amount of both information and context um, that, uh, you know, led to uh, the, the senior staff, you know, uh, being able to try to consolidate whatever uh, presentation they were going to make to the committee. You know, I think back on this as something that's almost hard to imagine right now. Um, it was a bipartisan staff. Uh, in addition to John Doerr, you had Burt Jenner, uh, who'd been appointed by the Republican uh, members. Uh, you had a very well-integrated staff in, you know, most uh, most ways, uh, you know, Bill Weld and I worked on things together from nearly the beginning uh, of the um, uh, process. And it was so carefully constructed and people were so uh, imbued with a sense of responsibility that uh, it, it was a great honor. I mean, it was such an honor to be part of something that was so uh, well, uh, envisioned by John and the senior lawyers, the chiefs, uh, as it were. And it was such an honor to see the, you know, very deep care that was taken in uh, uh, working on this 
incredibly serious uh, matter. And, and so I, I really think of it as a legacy that we do need to try to better explain and have the public and members of Congress understand. And I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm going to start singing from Camelot, but there once was a time uh, when uh, a Democratic majority Congress put together a process that included Republicans from the beginning that was led by extraordinary lawyers with a deep sense of reverence for the Constitution and a commitment to trying to enter into this uh, important endeavor in a way that was above reproach uh, so that whatever happened, and nobody had prejudged it, so we didn't know what would happen, whatever happened uh, would be seen uh, as credible, as legitimate. Uh, and honestly, I think you know so much credit goes, first of all, to Chairman Rodino, but then to John and everyone who uh, both created and managed uh, this process. So I'm really grateful to the library, Carla, and to the Kluge Center, Kevin, that you are helping to elevate this, and, and to Evan and, and Mike and others who thought about uh, making this uh, uh, possible, because we need to tell these stories. The final thing I would quickly say is, you know, and Carla, Kevin, and, and some of their team members and I were talking about this earlier, you know, we, we really have a problem with people not knowing history and not knowing what actually happened. And it's, it's, it's something that I think is influencing adversely a lot of the decisions that uh, we are seeing either made or not made now. And so anything that can try to raise the visibility and, and create a better understanding uh, of what uh, happened 50 years ago, uh, I think is beneficial on a number of fronts. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. How about that, Francis? When Secretary Clinton mentioned Rodino, she looked at you. <laughs> Rufus Cormier. When Tim called and indicated that we would be talking about legacy and takeaways from the Watergate experience, I thought that I would take an approach a little bit different from the other panelists. I had graduated from Yale Law School in 73 and joined Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison in New York and had been there less than six months when I received a call on a Saturday morning, a totally unexpected call from John Doerr, who had been a great hero of mine by virtue of his involvement with the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. And John indicated to me that he had been selected as special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee for the Nixon impeachment inquiry. And he asked me one question, which was whether I had taken any position with respect to the impeachment of President Nixon. And when my answer was no, he stated that then he wanted me to join his staff as one of his two special assistants. I mentioned that John was a great hero of mine, and in order for you to understand that, I wanted to take the approach of giving you some detail about my background. I grew up in Beaumont, Texas in the 50s and 60s in complete segregation. I knew no more than eight whites by name along uh, when my wife Yvonne, who's here today as well, and I enrolled at SMU in 1966. That was the second year that SMU had any black students. There were 11 student, black students at the time we enrolled three in the class that preceded me, and eight in our class out of an enrollment of 10,000 students. I was also one of the three black scholarship athletes who signed that year to play football in the Southwest Conference 
after SMU signed the first black player in the conference in 1965. So meaningful change in the status of African Americans in the South started to occur after the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954 when I was six years old. That case had little immediate effect on segregated schools in the South. However, Brown elevated the civil rights movement to a matter of national priority. And that led to ultimately to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Without those developments, my life would have taken a very different route after finishing high school. Now, John Doerr played a pivotal role in all of the civil rights developments, other than the Brown case itself, through his work with the Justice Department. While still serving in the civil rights division, among many other things, John had tried or directed the trials of numerous voting rights cases in the South. He escorted James Meredith onto the campus of the University of Mississippi after his court-ordered admission to Ole Miss. He helped to protect Dr. King and the Freedom Riders, Freedom Walkers, from Selma to Montgomery. He directed the trial of the murderers of the civil rights workers, Goodman, Scherner, and Cheney in Mississippi and he, insisted, he assisted with the drafting of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. John Lewis once said that Doerr gave civil rights workers a reason not to give up on those in power. So John was already a genuine hero of mine as a result of his courageous civil rights work when I joined the inquiry staff in early 74. Working with John had a greater influence on the way I approached the practice of law than any other person that I have met or have known. So the greatest takeaway that I came away with the, from the impeachment inquiry was was the experience that I had working with John Doerr. Thank you, Mr. Cormier. Evan Davis. So there's no doubt that John Doerr is a national treasure. Just a remarkable person who achieved so much in civil rights, and who brought about an impeachment proceeding that was perceived by the country as fair. And that's not an easy thing to do. We had partisan people on the committee, Wiggins from California, Dennis from Indiana, but we worked through with a solution that came from the center that was perceived by the country to be fair and just. And we also, I think, Secretary Clinton, I think we improved the standing of the United States internationally through what we did. Nixon, President Nixon, never say Nixon. John Doerr told us we always had to say President Nixon. Uh, President Nixon was a big player internationally. And so when he resigned, and by the way, no impeachment provision, no resignation, because he resigned because he was going to be convicted in the Senate. Uh, so I took a trip, a speaking trip, after working on the impeachment, and I went to India. And I was in Kerala State, which is a communist state in India, and they were dumbfounded that a capitalist society ruled by money could actually do something that had a basis in integrity. And then I, then I went to England, 
And you know, the English are generally skeptical. And they were very amazed that someone was removed for office for a cover-up. Because from their point of view, a cover-up was an everyday sort of thing. And I think that's one of the major takeaways, that a cover-up of criminal conduct is definitely an impeachable offense. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Governor Weld? Well, I feel lucky to be here. You see, I'm a diversity hire. <laughs> Harvard College and Harvard Law School. That'll do it every time. So I, I, thought, I thought Dick Nixon could have had a pretty good run as President of the United States. You know, so sue me, I'm a moderate Republican. I thought he had a lot of... Uh, a lot of potential. He comes back from the war, 1946. Him and Jack Kennedy are classmates together. They know, knew each other. They had a fair amount in common. They, they, talked, uh, they talked a lot. By anybody's estimation, he would have been considered uh, a, a potential star in, in the Republican Party, definitely on the, uh, uh, on the moderate as opposed to the hidebound, uh, hidebound end. Uh, he, he gets in office. Uh, you know, I remember my, my first year in practice, 1971, he's, he's putting in wage and price controls. This is Nixon. Uh, you know, environmentally, I'm a big environmentalist. We got the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Uh, we got Ruckel's House, we got uh, Bill O'Reilly, we got great Republican environmentalists. Things are, things are I thought, looking pretty good uh, for him. He might have forgotten a couple of things uh, along the way, but... Uh, We'll get to that uh, in good time. One thing I know he forgot that I read about in Bob Caro's book about Lyndon Johnson. Johnson, uh, at the height of his powers, was uh, lecturing some aspirant to the presidency, and he said, son, you gotta remember one thing. There's a bond between the President of the United States and the people of the United States, and it's a bond of trust. And if you lose that bond of trust once for five minutes, you're never going to get it back. And I think Johnson was right about that. Uh, unlike me, uh, Mr. Nixon had not majored in Latin, which I did both uh, at college in the United States and then pursued so-called greats, Latin and Greek, in, in England thereafter. So I was serious about it including the mottos that are dotted around the buildings in this town, and, and including the one at 10th and Pennsylvania where I spent a couple of years as head of the criminal division. But one of them is uh, Suprema Lex Salus Populi. Uh, and loosely translated, that is that uh, the highest exigency of, of the law and uh, law being uh, supreme over everything else, that is the refuge of the people, so law is like a house you can uh, you can hide in. Uh, I don't I don't think Nixon saw that the right way. I, I'm not sure that he ever went by the Justice Department and read Government of Laws and Not of Men uh, on on the building. But for those of us who worked there, it was easy not to forget uh, not to forget that one. So I, I thought he was doing okay. And then uh, in 1972, you get this stupid break-in, and, and uh, uh, you know it's a third-rate burglary. Um, and uh, so, but there's a certain amount of kerfuffle about it. So, Archibald Cox gets appointed a special prosecutor. I figure this is going to take care of that. Uh, Archie Cox taught me constitutional law at, at I'm sorry, Harvard. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he's a pretty, uh, pretty smart guy, I thought. So that would, uh, that would really take care of that. Uh, in, in the middle of 1973, I got a, a, a queer, uh, query, friendly inquiry, whether I would like to go to Washington and maybe uh, work on the anti-Nixon side of things, Watergate. Uh, and I said, ah, you know, my mother and I are going to be two people on the Watergate jury, if there ever is one, because neither one of us has paid any attention uh, to all the publicity, because we didn't have a television in our house. 
And they said, oh, well, I guess maybe you're not the right, uh, right person for, for this. So I, I didn't go down and take that job. Then later, uh, more like uh, September, I, I get another call. Would you like to come to Washington and uh, work maybe not on the Nixon side? Uh, as uh, Moorfield Story, a famous Bostonian, did, did before you uh, and uh, for an impeachment. And uh, I asked a friend of mine, William Moorhead, who is a senior member of Congress, a Democrat, a committee chair, I believe, his advice. He said, don't go near it. This thing is going absolutely nowhere. And everyone who is banded together publicly on the anti-Nixon side is going to be destroyed. This is the middle August, July, and as uh, Francis O'Brien said, people were not thinking uh, around the country, were not thinking the impeachment. They were not thinking Nixon was going to be removed. So I, I declined uh, that job too. Although something happened that made me a little bit nervous. Uh, the president gave a speech which came to be known as the child and the family speech. And he said, um, the average American is like a child in the family. And, you know, he wants to be left alone to live his own life and, and uh, be guided by others. But really, the he's, he's, uh, average American is like a child. So I'm thinking, now, what's his conception of the relationship between government and the people? And I thought, it probably means the government is up here taking care of things. And the average American is down there like a child in the family, just going about their everyday, everyday business. But when a real call has to be made, it's going to be the government making that call. That kind of didn't suit with my politics. And only one organization that I saw uh, saw it the same way, the New Yorker magazine, which I tell you, I think they have been the, the conscience of the United States since the days of Harold Ross at, in the 30s, William Shawn, who took over in the 50s, uh, and to this day with David Remnick. Uh, so they wrote in uh, Talk of the Town, they wrote about the child and the family speech, and they were nervous. They were nervous, too. Uh, at any rate, I, uh, I didn't take that job. I took Mr. Moorhead's... Uh, advice. And, you know, Archie Cox gets appointed a special prosecutor. And uh, I figure that takes care of things. And uh, so then Alexander Butterfield is talking in Congress about something totally unrelated. Throw away question. And by the way, there were no tapes uh, ever taken of anything in the White House, were there? He says, well, actually, everything was taped from stem to stern. There's a tape of everything that was ever said in the White House. And people said, well, that's interesting. And <laughs> Mr. Cox uh, issues a subpoena uh, for the tapes. And this is where I began to have to, I think uh, my office mate and I began to have to study this, because that was resisted on the grounds of executive privilege. Uh, and that didn't really fly all that well with Judge Gazelle and uh, the, the DC district court judges, and they, they didn't really uh, agree with uh, Mr. Nixon's uh, position there. Uh, but uh, so, so he declines, and then Cox uh, persists and said, I must have those tapes. And uh, it's getting to be October, and I'm still thinking, gosh, it's anybody's guess what's going to happen here. And then as I think Francis O'Brien again said, October 20th comes. And everybody's fired. Archie Cox is fired. Elliot Richardson refuses to fire him. He's gone. Bill Ruckelshaus refuses to fire him. He's gone. Cox is gone. Uh, and uh, the others are gone as well. And it's an entirely uh, new, new ball game. And the staff of Archie Cox, the day after he was fired, held a press conference and they said, and I think I quote more or less, whether or not this country will continue to be governed uh, by, by a, a government of laws and not of men depends now upon the Congress 
and ultimately the American people. Well, truer words were never spoken, and that's, uh, that's exactly uh, what happened. So uh, along the struggle, the way to try to get these tapes, uh, Nixon, I remember at one point, uh, proposes this so-called Stennis Compromise, which is that uh, Senator John Stennis, who uh, was not going to be up to this job, was going to review all the tapes and tell the world exactly <laughs> what was in them. Uh, and that, and you know, I think J. Fred Bizart was uh, instrumental in proposing that. And, uh, you know, Nixon thought that was uh, a pretty good idea. And let's be honest, that was nothing but an open invitation to be fobbed off the real issue. Uh, and if I had to put in one sentence what is the signal achievement of the Rodino Committee and the staff and everybody that worked together uh, in, in those, those months, it was not being fobbed off the issue. And indeed, the phrase laser-like intensity springs to mind uh, as we went about uh, our business. And I think that's... Uh, a major contribution not only to the jurisprudence but to the polity of the United States. And the principle is now, as a result of that, firmly established that uh, no man is above the law. And it's not even just the Supreme Court saying it in the tapes case where I think they said it, but it's established now in the society. Uh, at least I hope it is. And I think the fact that uh, it is it is ingrained, and it's in the collective conscious, uh, consciousness of the country, in the water table, so to speak, couldn't be more important. And uh, I think uh, the fact that it's so well established uh, is going to enable us to have, uh, have a happy result uh, rather than the opposite uh, this coming November, and that's really important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Weld. Um, I was going to, uh, I was thinking about people who were going to watch this, and um, they might not be as hopeful as the governor just was. And I was going to ask you what it was about the climate of 1973-74 that made your kind of inquiry possible, given that I think for many young Americans, what you've just described sounds uh, Im impossible or unlikely. I think something happened that we see occasionally. People rise to the occasion. Uh, Chairman Rodino turned out to be a great man and, and a great leader, and John Doyle was already a great man, but the committee as a whole, <coughs> there were partisans on both <coughs> ends who were rabid, uh, but in general, the great bulk of those 38 lawyers took it seriously and realized they were in a unique circumstance that had never really occurred in the country at all. The Johnson one didn't count. And for the most part, they, they rose to the occasion. Now, whether, whether that could happen now, I don't know. But there were people, Jack Brooks was one, Delbert Latta was one on the opposite side. They were utter partisans. I mean, they were hardcore either right or left, doesn't but the committee didn't let that drive their deliberations. And uh, you can read the speeches that the committee members made, and they are moderate, they are thoughtful, they recognize the, the importance of what they were doing, and, and you hope that that human nature of rising to a crisis uh, will, would carry forward, in, even in these times. Rufus? Well, I was <clears throat> just uh, going to say that that is exactly what has been identified is a concern that I have, that the work that was done by the in inquiry committee was widely and generally accepted by the citizenry of the United States because of the huge uh, 
uh, division that's now in this country, it will be, it is a question as to whether or not we can make, arrive at a result as was arrived at in that circumstance. That there was a sense that the president was held accountable for what had happened. The, it was further believed that as the governor indicated that, that the principle that no man was above the law was vindicated by the decision that was made. I think that there was a sense that checks and balances had worked. Uh, that uh, the free press had performed in the way that it had been intended that it would, that uh, after the resignation, that there was legislation that attempted to deal with the issue of surveillance that made the requirements for obtaining a warrant much more difficult that laws were passed that attempted to deal with the slush funds and other funding that was being provided in politics so that there, was, there were laws, campaign finance laws to attempt to deal with that, as well as um, laws that were intended to address some of the corruption and to try to nip that kind of thing in the bud. But John Doerr, when he initiated the investigation, made it absolutely clear that it was going to be completely nonpartisan. He indicated to us that we were not there to make a case against President Nixon, but rather to determine whether or not there was a case. And throughout the inquiry, John continued to insist that that was exactly the case, that the, uh, com the staff was not to make any decisions respecting the president, but, that, but to provide the facts for the committee to ultimately address that issue. And I think that a part of that success was the greatness of John Doerr and the kind of leadership he provided and that he was so absolutely fair. And Chairman Rodino was as well. As well. And as a result of that, I think the public accepted the decision that had been made by the committee. But given the degree of partisanship that governs at, that, at this time, I think it would be much more difficult to avoid that becoming a part of any examination of what a party person had done. Now, hopefully, we would ultimately uh, apply and the abstract principles that we are, we believe in, but there's still a concern that uh, this partisanship will result in a significant percentage of people whose greatest loyalty will be to partisanship or to what's in effect tribalism rather than looking at the facts. And hopefully that would not be the case, but I think that there is certainly a valid concern that the inquiry that was done in 1974 could not be carried out in the way that 
it was then in the current environment. Well, you know, uh, Watergate was not the first piece of uh, ugliness in American political history. Uh, back in uh, the 50s, 1954, uh, tail gunner Joe McCarthy of Wisconsin gave us a pretty good run for our money. Uh, this was the Red Scare. I have in my hand a list of uh, 38 people working in the State Department who were known members of the Communist Party. Utter fiction. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, Joe McCarthy uh, met his match in the most unlikely of circumstances. Uh, he really wanted to stick it to Joseph Welch, who was the senior lawyer from Hale and Door, who was representing the Army in those hearings. And uh, Welch had a very young man named uh, Fred Fisher, who's a junior associate at Hale and Door. He's then in my future law firm sitting there. And uh, McCarthy says, this young man here is a member of the Communist Party. And Fred Fisher said, what? And Joseph Welch says, there's a slight pause, and he says, have you at last, sir, no sense of decency? And that went plunk, plunk, plunk into the consciousness of the American people, and McCarthy was destroyed. Now, we can certainly hope with, uh, when we have a person running for president this year who says, my role model is Roy Cohn, who would always, ask, who would always say when a, a, a situation, a, a, rotten situation in the New York housing market came up uh, and what are we going to do? He would, uh, Roy Cohn would always say, don't tell me what the law is, tell me who the judge is. Uh, and uh, my, my sense is that uh, that, that person is uh, degringulating, uh, really almost disintegrating as we speak. Uh, my hope is that uh, the uh, two cases brought by Jack Smith in the public integrity section of the criminal division, which is my old stomping grounds, uh, even if they don't get tried before uh, the election, at least uh, if uh, the allegations become uh, widely, uh, widely studied, uh, it's not even going to be close. Um, we have another great panel to come, but I'd like to end uh, to give the last word to John Doerr. He was kind enough, thanks to Maureen Barden, uh, to do an interview for the library. What happened was in good part luck. And the luck was that I had this group of lawyers working for me that I could depend upon. And that were loyal and smart and didn't have any access to grind and didn't have any ambitions to fulfill. On behalf of those who are watching, thank you for your public service, thank you for your attention, and panel two is next. <laughs>